Any and all views expressed in The Devil in the Details are entirely my own. Although I am a member of the Church of Satan, I do not speak for the Church of Satan. I'm the Satanic Skeptic. When I'm doing Q&A after a lecture or a presentation, or when I've been a guest on other shows, I'm often asked, well, what do you think about that whole thing with the Baphomet statue at the state capitol? Or, how about that after-school Satan program? And I'm always a little bit at a loss because, frankly, I'm caught in a position where I have a split second to decide whether to give my unfiltered, honest opinion, or whether I think I have to temper my response to my audience. But also... Those things are all the Satanic Temple, not the Church of Satan. They have nothing to do with me, and I've no interest in the Satanic Temple. I don't want to give them more attention because they are already so good at drumming it up themselves. I don't really want to talk about them. However, in the hopes that I won't be asked any more in the future, I'd like to go on record and give my two cents worth. And since this is my show, I can say whatever I want without fear of offending others. I also think it's worth casting a skeptical eye on the Satanic Temple because they've done a great job ingratiating themselves with the atheist humanist community, covering up the truth about their organization. Now, I have friends who are a part of the Satanic Temple with varying degrees of commitment. Some just wanted a card and bragging rights. Others, I think, genuinely support the Satanic Temple and what they stand for, or at least profess to stand for. Anything I'm going to say, I don't necessarily mean as a personal attack, and I hope it's not taken that way. I also hope that I make clear where my frustrations are coming from. Naturally, I'm going to have facts on my side. I wouldn't expect anybody to just listen to me vomit forth my opinion. The Church of Satan's own Reverend Joel Ethan did an excellent job putting together a comprehensive Satanic Temple fact sheet on the Church of Satan's website. Go check it out. It contains embedded links, most of which are still active and which I've physically archived for future reference should the sites get taken down or the links go dead. The information contained within this episode is primarily going to come from Reverend Ethan's fact sheet, but I will fully explain any other sources I quote from. So, without further ado, let's dive into it. The Satanic Temple is a religious organization whose explicit mission is stated to be to encourage benevolence and empathy among all people, reject tyrannical authority, advocate practical common sense, oppose injustice, and undertake noble pursuits, whatever those are. That's quite a laundry list, and really more a mission statement for an activist group than a religion, but, uh, oh, wait, I I gotta back up, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The two publicly acknowledged co-founders of the Satanic Temple are Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jerry. Lucian Greaves is actually a character played by Doug Mesner, which is actually an alias. His real name is Doug Masico. Malcolm Jerry is also an alias of documentary filmmaker Kevin Soling. There's also allegedly a third unnamed co-founder who may or may not be real. Doug was a member of the Church of Satan since at least 2001, when according to artist and, at the time, Church of Satan member Shane Bugby, he was approached by Doug to produce illustrations for a new edition of the book Might is Right that Bugby was publishing. This is from a sworn affidavit to the District Court of Arkansas, available on courtlistener.com. Doug would later be invited to co-host a Might is Right special episode of Bugby's Radio Free Satan podcast, Radio Jihad. According to the affidavit, Bugby claims that he was originally offered the role of Lucian Greaves, but declined. The role was then given to an unnamed actor, before being given to Doug Masico, who Bugby claimed was an employee of Soling's. According to Bugby, the unnamed third co-founder of the Satanic Temple is David Guinan, the owner of a film production and advertising agency called Polemic Media. The Satanic Temple started in 2013, when the New York-based Spectacle Films put out casting calls for non-union actors to play the parts of Minions in a mockumentary about, quote, the nicest Satanic cult in the world. The name of the film? You guessed it, the Satanic Temple. And guess who the owner of Spectacle Films is? Kevin Soling a.k.a. Satanic Temple co-founder Malcolm Jerry. The ad, posted online at Actors Access, stated, We are seeking people from all walks of life, 
goths, grandparents, soccer moms, etc., to be the followers of a charismatic yet down-to-earth satanic cult leader. The shoot will be on January 25th in downtown Tallahassee. Actors will be required to wear a tasteful satanic garb. Bugby has stated that the original intention behind the mockumentary was pranking, quote, the public at large and in general the grossly inept media, a sentiment echoed by Doug, who in a 2013 Vice article said the Satanic Temple was both satanic and satirical, saying, The word Satan has no inherent value. If one acts with compassion in the name of Satan, one has still acted with compassion. Our very presence as civic-minded, socially responsible Satanists serves to satirize the ludicrous superstitious fears that the word Satan tends to evoke just as the yes-men use very catching theatrical ploys to draw attention to a progressive agenda, we play upon people's irrational fears in a way that hopefully causes them to reevaluate what they think they know, redefine arbitrary labels, and judge people for their concrete actions. This is a clear example of the Satanic Temple admitting that they only use the name Satan and use Satanic imagery and language because it gets a rise out of Christians. Curiously, the Satanic Temple's original website, when it launched in 2013, claimed they believed in and worshipped a literal Satan, which is weird when you consider that both Shane and Doug were members of the Church of Satan, which has always been explicitly atheistic. Doug later took personal credit for the organization's turn to atheism, telling Vice, While the original thinking was that the Satanic Temple needed to hold on to some belief in a supernatural entity known as Satan, none of us truly believed that. I helped develop us into something we all do truly believe in and wholeheartedly embrace, an atheistic philosophical framework that views Satan as a metaphorical construct by which we contextualize our works. Now, why would the original thinking be that the Satanic Temple needed to believe in a literal Satan? My best guess is because Doug and company weren't sure at first whether or not people would accept a satirical religion created with the express purpose to troll Christians if they didn't go all the way and profess to worship the devil. How much funnier would it be if actual devil worshippers also happened to be the nicest folks on the block? This just further shows that the idea of what exactly the Satanic Temple is, or is supposed to represent, has always been malleable and secondary to the goal of political activism. <laughs> Talk is cheap, right? So maybe what really matters are the deeds attributed to the Satanic Temple. So let's examine one of the first major actions of the Satanic Temple that people love to gush about, the Baphomet statue. What happened was, in 2009, Oklahoma State Representative Mike Ritz sponsored a bill to have a monument to the Ten Commandments erected at the Oklahoma State Capitol. <laughs> erected. Which it ultimately was in 2012, after Governor Mary Fallon signed the bill into law. Oklahoma citizens Bruce Prescott, James Huff, and Cheryl Huff filed suit in a state court arguing that using public ground was also a violation of Article 2, Section 5 of the Oklahoma Constitution. They lost and appealed their case to the Oklahoma Supreme Court, at which point the American Civil Liberties Union of Oklahoma became involved. While the case was going on, the Satanic Temple announced their plans to install their own statue, that of the Baphomet, next to the Ten Commandments Monument. Ultimately, the case of Prescott v. Oklahoma Capital Preservation Commission was decided by a 7-2 majority that the placement of the monument was unconstitutional. The Satanic Temple and their Baphomet statue had absolutely nothing to do with the court's decision. They weren't involved with the case whatsoever. The ACLU and their legal team did the hard work of standing up for the separation of church and state. The Satanic Temple postured and claimed the victory publicly, leading people to assume they were instrumental in winning the case. They weren't. A very similar scenario is currently playing out in Arkansas. On June 27, 2017, a similar Ten Commandments monument was erected at the Arkansas State Capitol. Both the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the ACLU sued, arguing that the monument was unconstitutional. The Satanic Temple wasted no time in offering to donate their Baphomet statue. However, according to Arkansas law, they needed legislative sponsorship, which they didn't have. Unfortunately, that decision led federal judge Christine Baker to rule that Doug Masico and Erica Robbins could join the FFRF and ACLU suits as interveners. To be clear, what the FFRF and ACLU are arguing is that the existence of any religious monument on government property constitutes government endorsement of religion, which you don't need to be a constitutional lawyer or scholar to know is unconstitutional. The Satanic Temple, by contrast, is arguing, hey, 
you don't need to remove the statue. Just let us put up our statue in a show of religious plurality, and we'll call it even. Fair? Or, as one satanic blogger for Patheos put it, TST's solution is that the answer can be more religion, not less. This tactic of provoking Christians into a there-goes-the-neighborhood response underlies all of the Satanic Temple's antics, from the Baphomet statue to their after-school Satan program, which I'll get to in a minute. In a nutshell, it works like this. Newcomers, who are not welcome, move into either a literal or figurative neighborhood. Their presence, perceived as invasive and a nuisance, in turn drives out established residents, thus ending their dominion. The idiom is believed to have originated during the era of desegregation, when people of color began moving into predominantly white neighborhoods, prompting what came to be referred to by sociologists as white flight. In the case of the Satanic Temple, the idea is that if evangelical Christians are legally forced to share their privileges with Satanists, they'll give up in disgust. If Christians have to share their religious monument space with Satanists, maybe they'll think twice about wanting to put the monuments up in the first place. That's a pretty big if, and I would argue contains the implicit assumption that these Christians are the kinds of folks who would respond to such provocation logically. Golly gee, I sure don't want a satanic statue. This whole thing's gone too far. I guess I should keep my religion to myself. There's absolutely no reason to assume that they'll behave like that. If somebody is gung-ho enough to put up a religious monument on the grounds of a state capital and doesn't understand or doesn't care how this is essentially state-sponsored religion, they're not going to calmly reassess their choices because you've trapped them in a gotcha kind of situation. It didn't work in the case of the Oklahoma Ten Commandments, and it hasn't worked in the case of the Arkansas Ten Commandments. The FFRF and ACLU are still fighting the legal battle to have the monument removed, while the Satanic Temple is fighting to have their own monument included. We're now five years into this battle playing out in the courts. How much more complicated has the Satanic Temple made the situation by introducing their own complaints? How much longer will it last, and how many more tax dollars will be wasted? Which brings me to their next big initiative that people love to talk about, the After School Satan Club, or as many people simply refer to it, After School Satan, or as I will be referring to it, ASS. As far as I can tell, the initiative began back in 2016 when the Satanic Temple sent request letters to dozens of elementary schools across the country. According to the letter, the After School Satan curriculum would include science, creative learning activities, songs, art projects, educational stories, and will teach basic critical reasoning, problem-solving, character qualities, and creative expression. Although the stated goals of the club are to focus on free inquiry and rationalism, while claiming proselytization is not our goal, the Satanic Temple openly admits, and I'm quoting from their website here, After-school Satan clubs meet at select public schools where Good News clubs also operate. For those who don't know, the Good News Club is an after-school program sponsored by the Child Evangelism Fellowship. Now, if the real goal was to focus on free inquiry and rationalism, why limit the reach of your program to only those schools where the Good News Club meets? Surely children in schools all across America could do with more science, creative learning activities, and rationalism. Why specifically target schools where the Good News Club meets? It's because this is another example of the Satanic Temple's pee-in-the-pool mentality. The goal isn't to do good by children, it's primarily to piss off Christians. The Satanic Temple's justification for ass are virtually the same as their justifications for their Baphomet statue, claiming, The pre-existing presence of evangelical after-school clubs not only established a precedent for which school districts must now accept Satanic groups, but the evangelical after-school clubs have created the need for Satanic after-school clubs to offer a contrasting balance to students' extracurricular activities. Just because somebody else set a precedent is not a good justification. Consider the old adage, if your friends jumped off a bridge, would you do it too? So, what are the claim for there being a need for satanic after-school clubs to offer a contrasting balance? Well, it just so happens that organizations like the Connectory already exist to bring STEAM, that's science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, learning opportunities to school programs. Why STEAM? Because STEAM opportunities help youth develop critical thinking, collaboration, and problem-solving skills, enhance creativity, and engage in an investigative process. Hmm. That sounds an awful lot like what the Satanic Temple claims ASS is going to do. So, ASS isn't bringing anything new or unique to the table. It's purporting to do exactly what already existing after-school programs already do and do well. Another example of a STEAM-promoting organization would be the First Lego League, which operates in over 110 countries and helps inspire youth to experiment and grow their critical thinking, coding, and design skills through hands-on STEM learning and robotics. 
or SHINE, Schools and Homes in Education, which serves children in seven school districts across rural Northeast Pennsylvania with a curriculum that places an emphasis on developing critical thinking and problem-solving skills, global awareness, and effective communication. Clearly, there is no need for ASS to offer a contrasting balance. There are wonderful after-school programs that already exist to offer a contrasting balance to the stultifying dogmatic beliefs the Good News Club are pushing. If anything, those programs need support reaching more children from more schools, not competition. But once again, just like with the Satanic Temple muddying the waters of the Arkansas court case and making the jobs of organizations like the Freedom From Religious Foundation and the ACLU harder, the Satanic Temple either doesn't realize that they just get in the way, or they don't care, so long as they get all the attention and stir up controversy. But hey, maybe you're thinking to yourself, but it works! Even if this might not be the best way, you can't argue with success, right? Well, guess what? Just like the Satanic Temple hasn't won a single court case with respect to the removal of religious monuments, their ass program hasn't won a single victory for getting the Good News Club out of schools either. I can't find a single example of a school district which has refused to grant ass the right to exist, which would give the Satanic Temple grounds for complaining that districts were privileging one religion over another. The closest I could find was a Los Angeles school that denied a proposal by the Satanic Temple of Los Angeles, stating, As a public agency, the district cannot appear to endorse particular programs with which it is not affiliated. Furthermore, the LA Unified District spokesperson, Shannon Haber, clarified that the Satanic Temple hadn't filed the proper LA Unified Civic Center permits required for such requests. Likewise, I couldn't find a single example of the existence of ASS prompting a change in district policies regarding religiously affiliated after-school programs. School districts simply aren't turning the Satanic Temple away in disgust, nor is the inclusion of ASS prompting any school districts to reconsider who they let use their facilities. Much like the Satanic Temple's Baphomet statue, the initiative certainly generates controversy and discussion, but ultimately fails to enact change. The end result is ultimately a net increase of religion hardly a victory for proponents of separation of church and state. There's something even more fundamentally wrong with the Satanic Temple's ass program, however. Annoying Christians just to make a point only makes you a pest of pests. The question of who gets the point isn't even considered. But when Satanists agitate to have their statues included alongside religious monuments, when Satanists agitate to have their own after-school programs included alongside other religiously affiliated after-school programs, it really gives Christians something to cry about. When they talk about how Satanists want to take over the country, or how Satanists all secretly run the government, they now have something they can point to as evidence that their kooky conspiracy theories are true. Satanists want to set up their own monuments because they secretly control the government. Satanists want after-school programs because they want to abuse our children. Considering the history of these kinds of accusations during the 1980s and 90s, a period of time referred to as the Satanic Panic that I've talked about extensively on this show, and even today with the prevalence of QAnon, these publicity stunts by the Satanic Temple aren't just foolish, they're potentially very dangerous. Go listen to my episode on the McMartin trial. The incalculable harm that was done to the defendants, the numerous children involved in the case, all because of a single woman's accusations. Insane. I mean, literally insane. Accusations of children being abused by their teachers. And you think it's a good idea to promote an after-school program that's explicitly satanic? What parents are going to send their kids to that? What teacher is going to sponsor that kind of club? You're not only putting children at risk, you're sticking your own neck out as a target for your accusations of ritual abuse. The prevalence of QAnon, and Emma Romero's recent article for Skeptical Inquirer, Searching for Satan in 2021, an update on satanic ritual abuse claims, are proof that the age-old fears of child-sacrificing Satanists are still alive and well today. As someone who has worked hard to raise awareness and educate people on the history of the satanic panic and the modern threat of QAnon, the idea of an after-school Satan program irks me to no end. So, that's my thoughts on those two topics. Let it be known to the world. Some people are probably thinking, Yeah, well, you just don't like the Satanic Temple because you're part of the Church of Satan. You've got an axe to grind. So don't take it from me. There are former Satanic Temple members who've gone on record about why they left. In March 2018, Jex Blackmore, a spokesperson and public representative for the Satanic Temple since 2014, announced her departure on Medium, citing, among others, Over the years, members and chapter heads have requested and proposed the implementation of a gender, sexual, and racial diversity policy to ensure equity within TST leadership and alignment to the mission. The demand was not simply ignored, but completely dismissed. While I was part of the organization, I witnessed male members of the organization exploit their position and influence to behave inappropriately and disrespectfully towards women. 
I myself experienced harassment and abuse from members who have now left the organization. I was not supported by leadership during these times, but was asked to let it all blow over. Despite being an organization that claims to be a champion for women's rights, and despite relying on the work of many strong and talented women, most of whom are unpaid, TST has not created an inclusive space for marginalized members. Likewise, while they have a mission against the exclusion of other voices, there has been no effort to create a diverse membership or rid the organization of a culture of racism and sexism. TST continues this hypocritic legacy to this day. The Salem Gallery regularly hosts whitewashed panels and art exhibitions. Members of the public donate money to support TST's campaigns in regards to women's rights and religious liberty lawsuits and events. However, despite many requests from Temple Chapters, the organization refuses to share how these donated funds are spent. Currently, there is no way of knowing if the money donated actually supports their legal actions. Without a transparent process of accountability, TST co-founder Lucian Greaves has taken on absurd legal battles under the guise of the Temple. He recently sued Twitter over religious discrimination, upset that his personal account was briefly suspended and TST's accounts have not been granted a verified status. Now, this decision by Doug to pursue a religious discrimination claim against Twitter was such a big mistake, it prompted both the Portland and the Los Angeles chapters of the Satanic Temple, as well as the Satanic Temple UK and London, to withdraw from the Satanic Temple. The LA chapter announced this on their Instagram. Our disappointment with the unilateral decision by executive ministries to expend resources pursuing this claim is only compounded by their choice to retain the law firm of Mark Randoza's counsel. Who's Mark Randoza, you ask? Why, he's a neo-Nazi defense lawyer whose law firm also happens to be representing defendants in cases related to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. Specifically, Rendaza is representing the leaders of the National Socialist Movement, Jeff Shope and Augustus Sol Invictus, who, perhaps not coincidentally, Doug joined in solidarity in boycotting a conference called the Left Hand Path Consortium back in 2016, after they, you know, decided having a neo-Nazi come speak might be a bad idea. Doug defended his choice of lawyer as a matter of defending offensive speech, something he probably has a personal vested interest in, as he is on record as stating, during the time in which he co-hosted Shane Bugby's Radio Jihad special episode on the book Might is Right, I think it's okay to hate Jews if you hate them because they're Jewish and they wear a stupid fucking frisbee on their head and walk around and think they're God's chosen people, and trying to win over Tom Metzger, former Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, to the idea of IQ-based eugenics by explaining that if it were the case that the black race as a whole were intellectually inferior, quote, you still wouldn't have to enact racial laws, you'd just have to enact intelligence laws, and if that, meaning black intellectual inferiority, was being the case, then that good segment of the population would have to drop off. Hmm, maybe that's why the Satanic Temple waited until September 14th, 2020 to announce on its official Facebook page, the Satanic Temple believes that black lives matter. Just to give you a clear idea of how absurd it is that it took this activist group that long to publicly announce this, the Black Lives Matter movement began in 2013. So seven years passed before they had anything to say about it. And I would also like to point out that on their announcement, they included a disclaimer stating, We must make it absolutely clear that the above is purely a statement of our morals and values. As a rule, TST does not endorse other organizations, and this includes the Black Lives Matter movement. So, they support the idea, but not the movement in general? This sounds like, once again, the Satanic Temple's way of co-opting social and political struggles into something they can make all about themselves, instead of working alongside and cooperating with others. Now, what's really curious is that Doug's essay defending his actions was titled Down the Spiral of Purity. According to a 2018 post on the Reddit neo-fascist forum Debate Fascism, the terms purity spiral or purity spiraling are neologistic jargon used by the alt-right. Hmm. There is even a neo-Nazi website called thepuritiespiral.com. But if that wasn't damning enough, in 2018, Doug moved to make all Satanic Temple chapter heads sign a non-disclosure agreement that included, quote, a broad non-disparagement clause that prevents former chapter leaders from making disparaging commentary related to the organization even, or especially, upon their departure from TST. Now why on earth would he do that? 
Thug's flirtation with fascism wasn't the first time, or the only reason, members of the Satanic Temple would very publicly decide to leave the organization. One of the more prominent cases the Satanic Temple chose to involve itself in was that of the pseudonymous plaintiff Mary Doe, who, in 2015, challenged Missouri's informed consent law, which works like this. The law requires a three-day waiting period between the initial consultation and procedure for having an abortion. During the consultation, the state requires the doctor to present the patient with an informed consent pamphlet, stating the life of each human being begins at conception. Abortion will terminate the life of a separate, unique living human being, as well as presenting them with other various options, such as listening to the uh, sonogram. As former Satanic Temple National Councilman and head of the St. Louis chapter, Nikki Mongo recalls, We were approached by a young woman we would later assign the pseudonym of Mary, and the subject of the Temple's eventual reproductive rights case. We wanted to help her, as is the case with oppressed and subjugated low-income single mothers in Missouri. In early September of 2016, Mary needed help with her living situation, which had become intolerable. I relayed the situation to co-founders Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jerry, requesting temporary financial assistance from the temple to help get her safely situated and on her feet in a new city. In a phone call with Jerry, he pledged to provide a nominal amount towards monthly housing assistance for a period of six months, once we worked out the details. Even though her situation continued to deteriorate, and our chapter members did all they could to assist her personally, our request for housing assistance was never fulfilled by the temple. Not only did Nikki speak up about the Satanic Temple's involvement with the case, but so did Mary Doe herself. Speaking to the Riverfront Times, she relates, I told Greaves, you need to be more open and listen to me. This was a sentiment also echoed by Nikki, who similarly expressed to the Riverfront Times, she was getting frustrated and wanted answers from me, answers I couldn't get my hands on. Nikki recalls, we were both feeling shut out. Both Nikki and Mary Doe expressed frustration with the Temple's National Board repeatedly blocking Nikki's efforts to organize local rallies so that the other chapters in other states could instead beat the drum for publicity. Perhaps the last straw was the demonstration the Temple gave outside the Planned Parenthood clinic. Members of the Satanic Temple dressed as priests anointing women with milk, ew, while one member carried a sign, America is not a theocracy, end force motherhood. Mary says she was frustrated that her case had been turned into a giant piece of performance art. I remember it was a giant mockery, she says. Maybe it was trolling, maybe they thought they were doing something effective. I didn't appreciate it whatsoever. That's not how I wanted to be represented. It's not how women in those circumstances should be represented. I wrote to him and the attorney saying, I want out of the case. So how did Doug, the head of an organization whose mission is to encourage benevolence and empathy among all people, respond? Lucian just completely lost his temper, Mary recalls. He was just screaming, he was talking fast, I couldn't get a word in edgewise. After he hung up, I tried to call him back a couple of times, but it didn't work. So I just blocked his number. It gets worse. According to Mary, the Temple-appointed lawyer, W. James McNaughton, wouldn't allow her to leave the case, which is a serious accusation, because attorneys are ethically bound to follow their client's explicit instructions as far as representation is concerned, and if, in fact, they refused to accept a client's request to leave a case, they could risk disbarment. On July 5, 2016, McNaughton sent Mary Doe a letter stipulating that she would have no intentional contact with any member of the Satanic Temple, and that he would have sole authority to make or authorize publicity with respect to the case. Most importantly, if Doe tried to fire McNaughton on her own, for any reason but incompetence, the agreement made her liable for a $1,500 termination fee. If that's not strong-arming someone into compliance, I don't know what is. So much for respecting the freedom of others. Ultimately, in 2017, federal judge Howard Sachs ruled the abortion rights of Missouri women, guaranteed by constitutional rulings, are being denied on a daily basis in irreparable fashion. Just like that, access to abortion services were expanded, and it had nothing to do with the Satanic Temple or their lawsuit. Perhaps most embarrassing of all, after the Missouri Supreme Court heard the Satanic Temple's appeal in 2018, and Missouri Solicitor General John Sauer admitted that a patient had the right to decline an ultrasound procedure, the informed consent law merely required healthcare providers to present the patient with the option, the Satanic Temple declared their admission an unprecedented triumph for the Satanic Temple, even though the Solicitor General was merely clarifying what was already the law.
establish that the legal track record the Satanic Temple claims for itself, which both members and supporters like to point to as evidence that the organization is doing some good in the world, is bunk. They haven't won any major legal cases, and have in fact complicated cases which were already being fought. Worse than that, the organization harassed and threatened the plaintiff behind their reproductive rights campaign, and their figurehead leader, who has a history of making anti-Semitic and racist comments and associating with neo-Nazis, employed a lawyer with a history of defending neo-Nazis to represent the organization as they sued Twitter. Classy. But what really pisses me off about the Satanic Temple and Doug Masico is two things. First, the danger their after-school program puts kids in. I can only imagine that any parents who would sign their kids up for such a thing are either too young to remember the satanic panic or too stupid to care, but it behooves any Satanist who happens to be a parent to educate themselves. If you're a member of the Church of Satan, you know one of our satanic sins is forgetfulness of past orthodoxy. What happens when accusations of satanic ritual abuse reemerge, and parents who let their kids attend ass or teachers who sponsored ass are fingered as suspects? A program like After School Satan provides something real, something tangible, that nuts can point to as evidence for their ridiculous claims. My second point, and this is more fundamental, is that the Satanic Temple takes Satanism, a religion and a philosophy which was supposed to be all about the individual, and reduces it to this narrow little box. It cheapens it to something that exists purely for shock value, purely as a reaction against Christian theocratic overreach. Satanism is reduced to a costume that somebody puts on only when they want to piss Christians off. Satanic Temple spokespeople are on record as saying, you don't even have to be a Satanist to join, you just have to support their political activism. How on earth, or hell, does that work as a religion? And those of you who I consider my friends and happen to be members, I, w I want you to know I love you, I have no hard feelings, but I don't consider you a Satanist. You're not a Satanist just because you have a card that says so. You're not a Satanist just because you think satanic imagery is cool and you have an axe to grind against Christians. You're a Satanist because you read the satanic bible and you saw yourself reflected in its pages. You're a Satanist because the philosophy of Satanism resonated with you. Now, some people might complain, but that Anton LaVey guy, he was a misogynist, and he was just an old fart with a lot of terrible opinions. What gives you the right to say I'm not a Satanist if I don't like the way he did things? To which I would say, okay, sure, LaVey was an admitted misogynist, and maybe he was just an old fart with bad opinions. But here's the thing. Satanism is not the man, Anton LaVey. Satanism is the body of work that he created, the philosophy that he synthesized from many different sources, and the cornerstone of that philosophy is individualism. It's atheism, the worship of oneself as God. You don't need to agree with or excuse every single thing Anton LaVey ever said or did. In fact, if you did that, you wouldn't be practicing Satanism. What exactly does the Satanic Temple offer in the way of a religion? Do they practice rituals? Do they have a court canon of books for studying? No. If you actually read what they have on their official website and pay attention to what their official spokespeople have said, it's very clear they're not practicing the globally recognized religion known as Satanism as codified by Anton LaVey in 1966. They have no deeply held religious beliefs from which one could reasonably argue that they're starting their own legitimate religion. Anton LaVey was smart enough to recognize that people have an inherent need for some form of religious belief. People respond instinctively to ritual and superstition. Even hardcore atheists who profess to be anti-religious still have their own private little rituals and engage in superstitious thinking. And that's okay. That's how we evolved. We're pattern-seeking animals. We see meaning in everything. LaVey recognized that engaging in ritual, playing with symbols and metaphors, was a poetic and powerful and beautiful way to give meaning to life. Magic and the occult and religion is just as important as art and poetry. Where you get in trouble is when you no longer recognize that you're fooling yourself, when religion stops being a magic trick and becomes a con. When people really believe they're talking to the dead, or talking to some kind of divine spiritual authority that tells them what to do and gives them the answers. LaVey conceived of Satanism as a religion where one could practice a controlled form of self-deceit, the kind of willing suspension of disbelief you use when you go see a movie or a magic show. That's why Satanism has a very rational, materialist philosophy as a bedrock, but also has ritual and dogma. 
the satanic temple, no ritual, no dogma. They've taken all the beauty and the wonder out of Satanism, and instead have tried to repackage it as secular humanism with spooky iconography. Spokespeople for the Satanic Temple have even expressed disdain for ritual magic, and tried to distance the Satanic Temple from the practice, which completely misses the point of the religion of Satanism. Perhaps worst of all, I don't even believe that Doug Masicko and Kevin Solon, Lucian Greaves and Malcolm Jerry, really believe in what they're doing. They had to create a religion and call it Satanism so they could argue from a religious standpoint against other religions. I think it's clear from the documents and the testimony of people like Shane Bugby, who helped Doug and Kevin get the Satanic Temple off the ground, and I've personally seen the email correspondence between Doug and Shane. I think it's clear that the Satanic Temple started as a joke, as performance art from two people with a known history for being provocateurs, and once they realized they were creating something that could really generate controversy and bring in money, they ran with it. In his sworn affidavit submitted to the District Court of Arkansas, Shane Bugby testified, Doug intended to enrich himself by using the Satanic Temple to manipulate people into sending him money. In particular, his main motivation was to use the Satanic Temple to create a substantial income at the expense of people in the metal music scene and others who are sympathetic to his aesthetic and political view. Doug was very candid that his goal was to use the Satanic Temple for personal gain in this way. Doug has gone on record as saying that the Satanic Temple was conceived as a poison pill in the debate over separation of church and state. Doug has admitted that the Satanic Temple, quote, play upon people's irrational fears in a way that hopefully causes them to reevaluate what they think they know, redefine arbitrary labels, and judge people for their concrete actions. I believe that where reason fails to persuade, satire and mockery prevail. Except, the question of whether or not anyone gets the point, or who gets the point, isn't ever considered. I believe it's clear, and inarguable, the Satanic Temple exists purely to use Satanic imagery and language merely as a theatrical ploy to advance a progressive agenda. In order for their poison pill strategy to work, they have to convince people that the Satanic Temple is a religious organization promoting a religion called Satanism. Never mind the fact that their strategy has demonstrably never worked. Now, some people might say, well, so what? What they're doing is for a good cause. I believe in it. What harm are they really doing? Here's where understanding history becomes important. Prior to the founding of the Church of Satan in 1966, there was no recognized above-ground religion of Satanism. Words like Satanic and Satanist were epithets that Christians used to condemn one another as heretics and blasphemers. While many have claimed affiliation with, or knowledge of, secret cabals of Satanists throughout history, absolutely no evidence for their existence has ever been produced, and academic scholars are in agreement that such groups probably never existed. This last point is of paramount importance, because people still believe these shadowy cabals exist today. For that very reason, it is critically important to maintain an understanding of what Satanism is and is not. And it's not just the Church of Satan who believe that maintaining clear and strict definitions of Satanism is important. I should like to point out that this was something recognized by the Committee for the Scientific Examination of Religion in their 1989 report, Satanism in America. On page 11, this report breaks with the established practice of calling almost anybody a Satanist. The words Satanism and Satanic are used to refer only to the recognized Satanic churches and their members. Individuals who derive their own occult systems are called self-styled occultists. If their beliefs involve the specific worship of the Christian devil, they are called self-styled devil worshippers. Organized groups of devil worshippers are referred to as devil-worshipping cults. Some people will object to the restricted use of the word Satanism, but to be fair, the public repeatedly uses the same criteria to differentiate between Christians and Christian pretenders. Now, back in 1989, the Church of Satan was the only recognized group representative of the religion of Satanism. Some will no doubt argue that, since the Satanic Temple was recognized by the IRS as a tax-exempt religious organization, therefore, they are also the religion of Satanism maybe just another denomination, like Protestants and Catholics. I would argue, however, that this is not the case. A religious denomination is defined as a subgroup within a religion that operates under a common name, tradition, and identity. 
So regardless of the doctrinal differences or practices between religious denominations, they all share a common core set of beliefs and events that were critical to shaping their identity. The Satanic Temple shares nothing in common with the Church of Satan, and has gone out of their way to stress this fact. Their own Kids Quick Reference Guide on their website is supposed to be an easy illustration of the differences between the Satanic Temple and the Church of Satan. They in fact have nothing to offer in the way of establishing themselves as a denomination of Satanism, and the guide itself is nothing more than the Satanic Temple bloviating about how great they are, a list of examples they can point to to say, look at all the great things we do, we're in the news, we're socially active, we're tax exempt, we have local chapters, we're relevant, and you're not. In short, the Satanic Temple rejects the idea of themselves being an offshoot of, or the result of, a schism from the Church of Satan, which they could have possibly claimed since Doug is an ex-member. They want nothing to do with us, and the feeling is mutual. The Satanic Temple rejects the writings of Anton LaVey, and reject Anton LaVey as the founder of Satanism because they think he's a misogynist old fart, although they offer no concrete literary canon of their own. The Satanic Temple have no religious practices, no ritual, and no dogma. In fact, their own quick guide explicitly points out that the Church of Satan believes in and practices ritual magic, whereas the Satanic Temple does not. The seven tenets of the Satanic Temple are the closest they get to deeply held and shared beliefs, although again, spokespeople have gone on record as saying you don't even need to be a Satanist to be a member, you just need to support their political activity. Furthermore, the seven tenets are antithetical to the founding principles of Satanism, not merely a recontextualizing or updating of Satanism. Think of it like this. Here's an example courtesy of a Church of Satan member, who was not me. Colonel Sanders created the recipe for KFC's original blend of herbs and spices. If someone else creates a different recipe, rejecting whole ingredients of what Sanders originally created and adding in whole new ones, and tried to sell the recipe to the public as KFC's fried chicken, would you accept it as such? No, of course not, because it's not KFC. It might be fried chicken, but it wouldn't be KFC, and you wouldn't call it that. Anton LaVey created the first and only legitimate foundation upon which the religion of Satanism stands and has been represented for over half a century. All the evidence points to the fact that Doug Masico co-created the organization of the Satanic Temple and worked to have it recognized as a religion purely to capitalize on the intention the word Satanism brings. <laughs> That's about everything I want to say about the Satanic Temple. I'm sure I'll probably be asked for my opinion on things again in the future, but now I can at least say, I already talked about this, go listen to my podcast episode. To anyone listening who is a member of the Satanic Temple or supports their agenda, I'd like to say, that's fine. You do you. I'm not going to tell anybody how they should vote or what they should think. But you really ought to have all the facts about how the Satanic Temple was founded, why it was founded, and why it operates the way it does just how successful, or not, their campaigns have been, how they've not lived up to their own professed ideals, and how they actually make the world a worse place for atheists, secularists, and Satanists. If you still want to affiliate with them, that's your choice. At least you'll be making an informed decision. To anyone listening who doesn't consider themselves a Satanist, but has in the past supported the Satanic Temple under the belief that they were doing something good, really sticking it to those religious theocrats, I implore you, stop. The answer to religion in the public sphere is never going to be more religion in the public sphere. It's simple math. If you believe in the American principle of separation of church and state, then what you want is a net zero amount of religion in government, not a net increase. And that's exactly what you get when you play the game of anything you can do, I can do better. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. Not once. All we have is more religious monuments and more religious affiliated after school programs. Organizations like the Freedom from Religion Foundation and the Center for Inquiry have done a fantastic job as nonprofits to work at keeping religion a private affair. And guess what? They've actually won court cases. So if what you really want is to fight back against theocracy, support them. You don't need to put on a costume and play at being a Satanist to make a difference.
The devil of doubt calls forth mankind to challenge all things, question all things. May the Luciferian light of reason guide you on your way ever forward. Hail science. Hail reason. Hail Satan.